schools, residential schools, uh, access and outreach. That's Krista and Krista will deliver the first paper. Natalie Cross is a Settler MA Public History candidate at Carleton University. Her research focuses on early residential school networks and settler colonialism in the 19th and 20th centuries. Her work aims to contribute to public education on Indigenous settler relations. Tom Peace is an Associate Professor of History at Huron University. Uh, Tom will be presenting with Natalie. He works on the history of settler colonialism and education in the Great Lakes and Northeastern part of North America. And then we'll have Jane Griffith. Uh, she's a settler scholar at X University, an author of Words Have a Past, The English Language, Colon Colonialism, and the Newspapers of Indian Boarding Schools. And then lastly is Skyly Storm Hogan, who is a researcher with No Histories Auto Office, who has published on community-based archival practice and the work of the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association with the Shingwak Residential School Center. Skyly worked with the SRSC from 2015 to 2018 in various roles before graduating from Western University's public history program in 2019. And I should have introduced myself. My name is Alice Norman, and I'm just here as your sort of moderator today. Um, I also study uh, Indigenous history and residential school history, especially the Mohawk uh, Institute. Um, and I'm also a uh, historian along with uh, Skyly at No History. Okay, if that's all good, um, I'm going to pass it over to Krista. Great, thanks so much, Allison. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah, okay. Uh, so I'm gonna be kind of doing a little bit of an introductory talk to introduce the Shamrock Residential School and provide a little context on some of the early records connected to the Shamrock Residential School and residential schools more broadly. I uh, really wanna preface my talk by saying that I'm here as a, a settler and really grateful to the Children of Shamrock Alumni Association who through their work, um, the residential school center where I work is possible, acknowledge their support and the survivor community and intergenerational survivor community. So the Shingwak Residential School existed in Sault Ste. Marie from 1874 until 1970. Uh, there's two photos on the screen. Uh, the black and white image is what the residential school looked like when it first opened in the 1870s. Um, and the color photo is what the second residential school on the site looked like. It was built in 1935 and they tore down the original building. Um, I want to acknowledge that though I'm kind of centering this conversation on the Shingwak Residential School, that this history extends beyond Sault Ste. Marie where it was located. Students came from all over to the Shingwak Residential School. So from as far south as Sarnia, Wapol Island, as far north as the James Bay Coast in Northern Quebec. Um, and some from Western Canada and the United States. So though this history, you know, is tied in its place to Sault Ste. Marie, it is really more broad than that. And it impacted families, communities, and individuals all across the land. Uh, the Shingwak School, as I said, it operated until 1970. In 1971, Algoma University, then Algoma University College, moved on to the site. Um, but if you had have talked to somebody who was at Algoma in the 1970s and said, like, this is an old building, what was it? Nobody would have said it was a residential school. There was institutional forgetting going on, some intentional not wanting to talk about it. Um, and it really wasn't until survivors came together in 1981 that a conversation around the residential school started to happen. Uh, so in 1981, the first Shangwak reunion was held. It was an event that was organized kind of like a school reunion, um, inviting former students to come back and begin to talk about their experiences. They really weren't sure who would be interested in coming back to a residential school. Um, they thought, okay, maybe we'll get 50 people. Over the course of the weekend, there was over 300 survivors and family members there, just because there was such the strong desire for people to be able to connect with other people who went to the residential school. Um, at part of that weekend, people indicated that they wanted their experiences audio recorded and video recorded. People also showed up with like a single photograph or a single document connected to residential schools and wanted a way to be able to share information about residential schools. 
that's how the Shenhuac Residential School Center or what would become the Shenhuac Residential School Center was set up. It's really a grassroots community-based archive. It's jointly managed by the children of Shenhuac and the Algoma University. Um, pretty important that it was set up in the 1980s. So it was set up you know, while there was still residential schools operating in Canada. It was set up before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission happened. It's the longest running survivor-driven archive in the country. Um, and it was set up with this desire to make sure that the history of residential schools was told from the survivor perspective, um, particularly, you know, in the 1980s when it was first established, there was no conversation from the survivor perspective out there. Um, so really wanting to make sure that that was well documented and well cared for. So I'm going to shift to talking a little bit specifically about the early history of the Shingwak School. So, as I said, the Shingwak School existed uh, from 1870 until 1970. Um, so almost 100 years. Uh, the early history of the Shingwak School is documented in a number of ways, including through photographs, financial records, annual reports like the one pictured here. Uh, we do have a student register for the first number of years of the residential school and also through letter books that uh, contain all the outgoing correspondence from the first couple of principals at the residential school. Um, and so part of the challenges of working with the early history of residential schools is that there's not like a definitive set of records or there's not a complete set of records. And so some of the work that the Shangwak Residential School Center does is really trying to make as much information accessible as possible. Um, and this is following the guidance of the Children of Shangwak Alumni Association, really being guided by survivors on what type of content should be made accessible to the general public, what type of materials should be made accessible just to survivors and families. Um, but generally, they really want the truth of residential schools to be out in the public, to be something that's shared and talked about. Um, so all the types of information that I've listed here, they're all materials that we've worked with in the residential school center and that have been made accessible online through our website. I'm going to talk a little specifically about the Xinguac letter books. So under a project that was led by my colleague Jenna LeMay, um, we worked with this collection of 10 letter books from the first and the fourth principal of the Shingwak Residential School. These cover the lesser known period of residential schools. And like I said, they really cover the outgoing correspondence from those principals. So this includes everything from letters to um, Indian Affairs, letters to other residential school principals, letters to the Anglican Church, uh, as well as correspondence with, uh, in some cases, parents of residential school students. Uh, there's a lot of information in these letter books around daily life at the residential schools, as well as information that kind of places the Shingwak Residential School in the greater context of residential schools across the country. I'd say more importantly, though, is there's lots of information about individual students in these letter books. So it might be about how that student was doing at the residential school. It might be something about medical care that was given to a student, uh, what happened to the student after they left the residential school. So one of the things that we're currently working on at the Shingwak Residential School Center is working to create um, transcriptions of these letters. If you've seen from the photos, they're a little hard to read. They're all written on onion skin paper and the text is sometimes illegible. So working with um, our staff to go through the letters and create, you know, student indexes or pulling out student names from them, as well as creating transcripts that people can read to make this content more accessible. I think is some of the really important work that's happening right now around this early history of residential schools. Um, lastly, though, I do want to kind of frame this conversation around the fact that this work is really being done with the consent and desire of the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association. 
we definitely uh, follow the practice that, you know, just because something is in the public domain doesn't mean that it should be online or just because something, you know, is old enough doesn't mean that it should be online. It needs to be prioritized by community. Um, the work that the center does is really collaborative. So for example, uh, the letter book project that Jenna LeMay worked on when she was working to create keywords to help describe those letter books, uh, she worked with the Children of Shangwak Alumni Association. So they sat down around the table and had conversations about what type of language should be used to describe these letters, uh, how to describe the contact, how to describe place names and individuals. Um, so it's a very collaborative uh, process and really focused on centering individuals and relationship building. Um, and I think that's something that's at the core of everything the Shingwalk Residential School Center works. I think it's really important to highlight, um, particularly when talking about the early history of residential schools. So I think there sometimes is the temptation to say, well, none of those survivors from that time period are left. So we can just make this content accessible. Um, but I think that's when it's important to go back to community, go back to intergenerational survivors and have those conversations and do the work through community engagement and through relationship building to make sure that this work is done in a good and holistic way. So I'm gonna leave it there and turn it over to uh, our next presenter. Morning, Tom Peace and Dichnikaz, Hamilton Dunjaba, London Dida, Jagannath Andal. Good afternoon and uh, thank you for joining us. I wanted to begin with a little bit of Anishinaabe Moan that I know, uh, because I think it's important that when we discuss uh, residential schools, uh, that we use uh, the languages that these schools so often sought to, sought to destroy. And to demonstrate the ways in which these are living languages uh, and call attention to the present day and historical multilingual nature of many of the places in which we, in which we live. I'm speaking to you today from London, Ontario, a place built following the 1796 St. Anne's Island Treaty and a city that, as we'll discuss shortly, had significant ties to the running of the Mount Elgin Institute, the Shingwak and Wawanashomes, and the Mohawk Institute. As I've become familiar with the early records of these schools, I've encountered children who have died while in the school's care, although I don't know if school's care is the right term to use there. And I think we should just take a moment to honor these children and the hundreds of others whose resting places uh, we're now just learning about uh, in Kamloops and Brittany. I'm a relative latecomer to studying the history of residential schools. When I took up my current position as a history professor at Huron University in 2014, my research interests were focused on literacies and schooling in, in terms of the 19th century Quebec, New England, and the Maritimes. And upon my arrival to Huron, though, I quickly learned that the university was part of this history, as some of Huron's first students were Anishinaabe men uh, or men from Six Nations who were studying for the Anglican priesthood in the, in the mid 19th century. The intersection between Christianity and schooling, a, a legacy of some of what I was studying was a core part of their identities. So this uh, sparked a bit of my interest. And if you think about uh, the last a decade, you might realize that just after I arrived, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission filed its final report and it's 95, uh, 94 calls uh, to action. And it was in that context that my colleague Amy Bell invited me to join her in putting together a student research learning project that probed Huron's rare book collection, much of which comprises of missionary texts in Indigenous languages from throughout North America. Um, and we used these books as a direct and tangible way of understanding how our institution related to Canada's colonial history and the history of residential schools. We called that project Confronting Colonialism. And if you want to find out uh, more about it, I'm just uh, putting a link in the chat to what now looks like a dated website. This is done in 2016, 2017. But it gives you a sense about how, uh, how that project worked. While we were doing that project, um, 
Krista McCracken and I began uh, discussing discussing this work through our, our cl the collaborative work that we had been doing before then on activehistory.ca. And I don't recall the specifics about how we got onto this exactly, but uh, I think it's important to call attention that it was Krista who drew my attention to Edward Francis Wilson. Wilson was Huron's first librarian, but as some of you probably know, he was also a driving force in the building of the Shingwak Residential School. And so I dug in a bit more deeply. Deeply, I took a week up there at uh, the center, which is a fantastic resource if you haven't been. Uh, it, it's really uh, an important place to visit. Uh, and there I read through Wilson's papers, uh, some of which uh, Krista showed you a few minutes ago, and realized that there was much more to this story, especially when it came to how Huron, uh, the institution that Huron spawned, Western University, which you're probably more familiar with, and, and the Shingwak Residential School. The third vector has to do with the connection of the Anglican Church. Huron has historic ties to the Anglican Church and the diocesan archives for the Diocese of Huron is, in, uh, is, is at our university. In our history program, it's important for us to engage uh, students in the archives and uh, get them learning how to go through uh, historical records. And so as I was going through the uh, church archives for this purpose, uh, the archivist uh, there uh, introduced me to the 19th century records of the Mohawk Institute, Canada's oldest and longest running residential school in Canada, which Huron also has significant ties to. Shortly thereafter, in an unrelated meeting with the executive director of the Woodland Cultural Center, which is at Six Nations uh, and is the custodian of, uh, of, the, of the Mohawk Institute's building today, we got to talking about the need uh, to find student names and records. And so together, we worked together to put together a project to digitize and transcribe a decade long attendance register from the 1860s that included over 400 uh, students who attended the school uh, during that decade. So I just say this, uh, this is a long winded uh, introduction uh, for which I apologize to say that over the last five years, uh, I've been working with students on various projects related to Huron and Western University's uh, relationship to the residential school system. And for the past three years, one of those students, Natalie Cross, has been using uh, the Huron history curriculum to dig more de deeply into this history. And so today, Natalie's here to share with you about her work on Wilson, Western, and Huron, which was just recently published in the journal Historical Studies in Education. I'll put a link to that article if you want to know more uh, in the chat. And now I will turn it over to Natalie. Can you everyone see my screen here and hear me okay? Excellent. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chimi Gwich. Thank you for having me today. I'm really looking forward to this discussion alongside the important work done uh, by the fellow panelists. And again, I want to encourage you, if any of this is heavy, um, to please seek out the support and care that you need today and consult the resources in the chat. Today, I'm currently situated on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation in what is today known as Ottawa. And I also want to acknowledge uh, that coming to understand the histories I'm going to talk to you about today came with learning and living across the traditional territories of Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenni Lenape, and Attawandaran communities in London. I, I also do want to recognize as well the leadership of the children of Shingwak Alumni Association and the Shingwak Residential School Center and the role they play in residential schools, uh, public education and awareness, which has deeply shaped my own awareness of the systems. So with the recent uh, Kamloops discovery of 215 children and other schools like Brandon adding to the list, education on residential schools continues to be critical. TRC call to action 62 calls for funding to post-secondary institutions to educate teachers on incorporating Indigenous ways of knowing. And part of meeting this call should also include a critical understanding of how such post-secondary institutions possess deep and complicated roots with Indigenous peoples and residential schools. So using the digitized Wilson letters as an anchor, it would only take me reading through a few of them to realize how tightly knit together Huron, Shingwak, and the history of these education systems are. So while schools practice what scholars call a logic of elimination, they were also framed with a logic of inclusion. And in this case, however, rooted 
in an Anglican evangelical value to bring Indigenous students into conformity with settler norms. This was promoted through individuals like Wilson and the founders of Huron College and Western to facilitate settler colonialism and cultural genocide. This was a logic that sought to remake Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Muncie, Delaware land and peoples in the Great Lakes region. So today I'm gonna to walk you through some of these common social networks of Huron and Shingwak, the parallel funding networks that link the two and conclude with how the inception of Western was also crystallized through these connections. So looking at the founding moments of Huron and Shingwak shows how similar transatlantic colonial relationships were, uh, were established and sustained, uh, sustaining the work at the schools. But I want to also note that it's important that to realize that the Shingwak home, or rather the schooling and education in the Bawating or Sault Ste. Marie area was originally conceived through the vision of Ojibwe chief Shingwak owns of Garden River, who envisioning a teaching wigwam that advocated for cross-cultural education to ensure his community's prosperity facing the growing settler population. After his death in 1854, his sons Augustine and Bukwijanene took up the son took up the task further, and eventually accompanying Wilson to fundraise for the Shangwak home. Once he was in Garden River as a missionary in the 1870s, this vision was appropriated by Wilson, resulting in the school being opened as an Anglican residential school in the 1870s. Uh, when while the original building burned in a fire and reopened in 1875 present for that reopening was the Bishop of the Diocese of Huron and Huron's founder and principal, Isaac Helmuth. This was not the first time that Wilson and Helmuth had met. 10 years prior to Wilson and Bakujanene first facing English crowds to fundraise for the Shingwak home, Huron's founders, Helmuth and Cro Benjamin Cronin circulated and fundraised in similar Anglican and missionary networks to solicit aid for their Anglican college in London, Ontario. Fundraising tours were used as a tool to appeal to what Sarah Flew calls an ethos of giving. So this cultivated settler philanthropy to support Anglican church work and schooling. In 1865, seeking funds for their educational project, it was on one of these trips that they first met the young Wilson, born in England to an influential evangelical family involved with the church missionary society. Wilson, alongside his letters, also sketched an autobiography pictured here on the bottom. Under the title of My Own Old English Friends is a photo of Helmuth and that through Bishop's Helmuth influence, uh, I was first to come to Canada. So after Huron opened in December, 1863, Huron was one of, uh, uh, Wilson was one of Huron's earliest students. Uh, after being ordained, he served in the diocese of Huron as a missionary in the lower Great Lakes amongst Anishinaabe communities before moving uh, to Garden River and then eventually beginning his work in Sault Ste. Marie. It would be in this early mission work where Wilson would also meet a Huron contemporary of his, Keshegwinene John Jacobs, an Anishinaabe missionary uh, originally from Rupert's Land, who Wilson frequently corresponded with while working at Shingwak. While Jacobs was one of Huron's earliest Indigenous alumni, it was clear that by using the language of Christianity and calls to civilize, Cronin and Helmuth sought out these Indigenous candidates to attend their schools. Even though this was a language of inclusion, the core purpose of these institutions was to bring Indigenous cultures, religions, and politics into conformity with Anglican ones. Secondly, by deconstructing this Anglican social network, we can rethink connections between uh, residential schools and colleges through how it consolidates, for example, with the Peach family. Huron's first major benefactor was the wealthy Bristol-based Reverend Alfred Peach, who, believing in Helmuth and Cronin's founding vision for Huron, bestowed the college 5,000 pounds. Peach also had a sister named Ketsia, who frequently donated to the Shingwak home. As you can see here, Ketsia was also written into Wilson's autobiography, right beside Helmuth, referred to uh, as a kind Christian lady who made us many a liberal gift. Indeed, it was mainly through her generosity I was enabled to start the Shingwak home and afterwards the Wawanosh. Clearly, Huron College and Shingwak home met and appealed to this ethos of giving from both Peach siblings, demonstrating the role of, ben of benefactors in 19th century Indigenous education. So Wilson's early work of, as principal of the Shingwak home also challenges simplified narratives of how residential schools were funded by church and government. And while the Shingwak home certainly received uh, per capita funding from the government, Wilson also solicited donations from the public to keep his schools running. These donations were tracked in lists or in subscription lists uh, that Krista had mentioned earlier in newspapers like the Algoma Missionary News and Our Forest Children. Alfred Peach, but mostly Ketsia, assumed the roles of benefactors for the home. 
1877, Alfred Peach was listed at having donated 25 pounds. Ketsia donated 100 pounds, as you can see here, on top of uh, another 50 for supporting children, uh, in comparison to an average donation of about 5 to 10 pounds. Uh, she also at one point supported Wilson's salary. So the connection to Huron tightens even further when Wilson wrote to the college saying, with a simple reference to their last name, that the Peaches both assist considerably in support of our homes and would be interested if one of our pupils was received with Huron College. So clearly both Huron and Shangwak were woven together through a settler funding stream that supported colonial education products, projects that sought to assimilate Indigenous students into settler Canadian society. So while Ketsia was also a main anchor in the social and financial network, uh, Wilson did fundraise profusely in domestic Anglican circles in Canada. On a fundraising tour, as you can see here in 1877, Wilson was accompanied by two students and noted they traveled over 4,103 miles, addressed over 5,300 uh, 5, people and 67,000 Sunday school children. So indeed, you can see how this fundraising tour shows how Wilson extended the work of residential schools beyond diocesan boundaries, and also how the homes and the students were framed and propagated to be included in Canadian society on the basis of cultural assimilation and civilizing to the standards of education that the schools and their networks stood for. So as the residential schooling system grew, so did the post-secondary, and these were not parallel educational histories but ones that were tightly linked with the civilizing mission and founded on stolen Indigenous land. Bishop Helmuth, after opening Huron College, made it his mission to open a university alongside a group of Huron College alumni and crafted the vision of Western, which opened in 1878 in London. While it is secular in purpose, its governance required members to be of the Church of England. The, the Shingwak Homes uh, networks then overlapped as Alfred Peach became Chancellor after Helmuth in 1884. Wilson and Peach were in contact during his chancellorship and demonstrating Wilson's place in these relationships, Alfred actually contacted him for information about Western, to which Wilson replied, uh, I can obtain this in an indirect manner for you. Again, fundraising was also used in, by Helmuth, importantly, to secure support for Western, but what is left out of the dominant narrative is how Helmuth fundraised in Indigenous communities as well to frame Western as welcoming to Indigenous students. Following an 1881 visit to Bekejwanong Unceded Territory or Walpole Island, Jacobs, the missionary I had mentioned previously, filed a report saying the community was interested in the university as they have a number of boys attending present the Shangwak Institute at Sault Ste. Marie, Algoma, again pointing to uh, students coming from all over the Great Lakes to attend these schools. We have no doubt that when the Western University is opened, uh, individuals will continue to avail themselves from the grand privileges of obtaining a university education. So Western and Huron became these educational stepping stones from Shingwak and other residential schools like the Mohawk Institute. Wilson and Helmuth's institutions were deeply entrenched within a mid 19th century ethos focused on destroying indigenous homelands in the name of civilization and modernity. The case of these three schools is only but one example of a tight settler colonial schooling network, and these are not just narratives of the past. At present, X University in Toronto has come to face its past of upholding a genocidal and colonial memory of its past namesake. And so if universities are to take decolonization and reconciliation seriously, they should move beyond performative actions and confront their histories as institutions interwoven with residential schools and settler colonialism. Thank you. Hey, everyone can see that? Yeah, good. Okay, so hi, I'm Jane Griffith, and um, I'm speaking to you from Dish With One Spoon territory in Toronto. Um, I'm a settler scholar and want to acknowledge any survivors as well who are in the audience today. Thank you so much for attending. Um, we've heard a lot about Edward Francis Wilson. Um, and I'm going to speak a little bit more about a school he had planned that thankfully never opened. Um, 
Wilson had schools in Ontario, he had schools in Manitoba, and he had westward expansion plans as well um, that didn't actually come to fruition. Um, one such school was planned for Medicine Hat in 1892. So why pay attention to a school that didn't open when so many schools and other colonial tactics to remove Indigenous people from their lands, families, languages did exist? Well, this example, it shows the fickle nature of federal funding for schools, but it also speaks more largely to what I want to focus on today, which is settler community support. So we speak a lot about church and state responsibility, and, and we should, but perhaps we speak less of um, how much settler communities were boosters of schools and, and made them actually come to fruition. So in early 1890, Wilson bought nine acres of land in Medicine Hat for $700 and he quickly encountered financial challenges. These are some renderings of what the school was supposed to look like if it were to have come through. Um, the federal government originally pledged $5,000 to build the school, but then the motion was thrown out in council. Wilson had already jumped the gun though and uh, bought the land and started to build some of the walls um, and lay some of the concrete down. So why did the government refuse to pay this? Well, in 1883, the federal government had just opened um, three industrial schools and they were really expensive. The, the prices skyrocketed. So the federal government responded by instituting the per capita model, which paid per student rather than the actual cost of running the school. It was a huge reduction in funding, which made the schools even less safe for students. Um, and then another way was in moments like this where money was planned or promised for a new school and then was taken away afterwards. Um, so you can see here what Wilson had hoped the school would look like and he circulated these renderings throughout to, to fundraise to gather support from settler communities. Um, and these schools, the, they were often designed um, lavishly and it's so important if you read um, survivor memoir, survivor fiction, survivor poetry from today, there are many descriptions of uh, the architecture of schools and how they continued the assimilative curriculum of the schools. So in Richard Wagamese's novel, Indian Horse, he portrays this disorientation when the main character Saul first comes to the school um, and sees this four story structure just totally overwhelming him and then in Rita Joe's poetry as well she has this one poem called hated structure and she describes um seeing the school as a child as quote a building I held in awe since the day I walked into the ornamented door and I'll return to both of these authors at the end of the talk but just to keep them in mind when thinking about Wilson's pl architectural plans and how they're received by survivors who write today um, so Wilson started construction before he actually had the catch in hand, and he was desperate to make this happen, um, to realize the school. So this is a view of Medicine Hat, um, the town site in 1890. Um, he takes to touring two children. So Natalie just spoke of a fundraising tour in 1877. He did another tour where he took two Shingwok students to England and toured them around to gather more money uh, for this school in Medicine Hat. So these children are removed a second time from their families, their lands, their language to go all the way to England to help support a school all the way in Medicine Hat. Um, but even with this fundraising from the England tour, he didn't have enough money and he turned, he turned to the residents in Medicine Hat, who were all too eager to support the school. So why Medicine Hat out of all the places Wilson could have proposed the school? Um, he described it to settler supporters as in the center, quote, of Indigenous peoples. So he said this was a space of Cree, Nakoda, Blackfoot peoples um, who were nearby. 
But what's so important is he described them as close, but not too close. Um, he, he stated in the Medicine Hat Times, the local newspaper of the town, that, quote, this place of the school has been selected being at a convenient distance from the reserves, end quote. So such a statement reveals how child apprehension is just totally unquestioned here. Um, it was just placed as every day and a casual thing he could include in the newspaper. And the settler readers would accept this as casual as well. The statement also aligns with broader, the broader settler philosophy that indigenous families and homes being too close to a school could undermine the school's agenda. Um, but if we flip it and, and frame it another way through the lens of survivor fiction and, and testimony and, and poetry, the parents were a real threat to a school running. Um, hence this need for greater distance too. So it, it also shows the, the other side as well. So um, this insistence on removing Indigenous children from, from their parents, their lands, their languages is starkly hypocritical because at the exact same time that Wilson's trying to shore up funds for this new school, Medicine Hat white settler residents were trying to create a school for themselves too, a union school for older children. So they had a, a community school, but if their children wanted to go to a good quote unquote, high school or college, they generally sent their children to Ontario. So you can see this quote here for the Settler Union School. Um, the Medicine Hat Times said that this school would enable boys and girls so that they can procure a high school education without being removed from the restraining influences of home. So for Indigenous children, the proximity to their home is a threat to their scholastic success. For settler children, their proximity to home would offer this really positive restraining influence and they desired very much to keep their children nearby. Um, as Wilson described elsewhere, he believed residential schools should be in quote, a white center where the pupils can learn trades, mingle with white people, attend an English church and be as far as possible separated entirely from their old friends and old habits and associations. Notice too how um, language, um, uh, polities, economies are uh, framed as old friends and old habits and old associations. But you can see from this photograph, um, so here's the town looking south. That's the frame of the school. It looks like it's fully built, but it's not actually. So it's not part of town. It's still across the Saskatchewan River. Um, and in this time, the only way to cross the river would be by a ferry, by foot when the river was frozen, or by illegally crossing a government rail bridge. So it wasn't actually part of the town the way Wilson described. So again, this whole close but not too close mentality of positioning where the school should be. So how did Medicine Hat residents feel about this proposed new school? they were in support um, big time. So for one, they heavily fundraised for the school. And this is common. There was often broad support from settler communities for residential schools because colonial tactics like schools, but like many other tactics as well, they eased white access to indigenous lands, but were packaged as Christian charity. But Medicine Hat residents also wanted this school because, quote, it, it stood as an institution which will aid materially in the town's enlargement and prosperity. It should also be remembered that the building of this school on the opposite side of the river will be another factor in bringing about a much desired end, the construction of a passenger bridge across the river. So this is, to me, a really disturbing line. It, the motivations are completely laid bare that bringing this school would bring economic benefits to the residents. That's why they were rallying around so strongly to bring this school to their town, a bridge. Um, and this isn't isolated to my Medicine Hat. It, it happened in other schools um, when communities wanted them near nearby, but not too nearby as well. Um, in Brandon, Manitoba in 1891, and Brandon has been in the news also for a mass burial site this week. Um, their school was, 
was hoped for by the community members and did get built because it was seen to bring employment to the community. In 2017, the CBC reported how non-Indigenous Newfoundland families have been taking in Indigenous foster children from Labrador. And um, this influx of children has now meant that the local school didn't have to close, the town got a new office, local businesses prospered from all the new social workers and support staff that came into the school. Um, so to be very clear, um, this is not residential school in Newfoundland in 2017 is not Medicine Hat in the 1890s, um, but there's a similar um, uh, phenomenon here of uh, child apprehension in, of Indigenous children as being, um, bringing prosperity to a settler town. So Wilson's strategies included to help raise support of imagining the space and then hoping that it will be built later. Um, sorry, and that's the quote about it bringing the bridge in the Medicine Hat Times. So Wilson employed this device called the Ruck and Figure where you view something from behind. And art historians will tell you it, it offers uh, visual power over to what's being seen and the viewer of the painting is aligned with the viewer in the painting. Um, so Wilson used this technique when he was trying to gather more money from Medicine Hat residents for, for fundraising purposes. So here he is gazing onto the site of what would be what he hoped would be the future sc uh, school. And he states alongside this this self-portrait, there is the very spot where the institution is to be built, right on the banks of the River Saskatchewan on the opposite side from the town. See how anxiously a certain gentleman is gazing on the spot from his grassy couch on the hilltop, picturing in his mind the three handsome buildings which are to arise by and by on those three vacant patches. So he's offering this to readers who are then motivated to donate money to help one day make the school. But again, thankfully, it didn't actually ever happen. And there's a continuity here. Um, this is an advertisement from uh, Teach for Canada, which is a nonprofit organization um, that has, it places um, newly credentialed teachers in Northern Indigenous communities um, to address teacher turnover. And the program has received a lot of criticism um, but it's early promotional campaigns you can see employs the same visual rhetoric of um, two people from the outdoors, in the outdoors, looking onto an open landscape with this um, slogan, next level teaching for a better Canada, where Indigenous education is, is offered um, as uh, nation building. So again, to be very clear, Teach for Canada is not a residential school. Nothing is the same as residential school. Um, but there is a continuity here with promotional messaging from the 19th century to today. So reactions to Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission have included denial that non-Indigenous people were aware of Indian residential schools and that such sites of crime were solely the product of church and state. But the case of Medicine Hat and others show that settler communities were actually really invested in having these schools come to their communities. They were active participants in, in wanting them to come. Um, and all throughout the history of residential schools, we know that Indigenous children, parents, communities fought against school curriculum, pedagogies, diet, conditions, etc. And this resistance was happening at the same time as Medicine Hat was being planned as well. Because even at Battleford School in Saskatchewan, which was built in 1883, there were parents um, delivering considerable pushback to that school, even at the same time when Medicine Hat was being built. So to wrap up and return to these two authors, um, in Indian Horse, when Saul returns to the school building as an adult, this building that had, as a child had overwhelmed him, it's defaced, it's smashed, it has smashed windows, bullet holes, graffiti, there's excrements um, all over the school. And the speaker of Rita Joe's hated structure, um, she encounters this building and it's just covered in grime. 
So there, there are ways that uh, survivor testimony, uh, fiction, poetry is, is undermining as well these architectural renderings that you can find in the archives. Um, today. So thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I'm just getting my slide presentation set up. Um, so as a short intro, um, my name is Skyly. I uh, worked with uh, Krista at the Shingwalk Residential School Center, and I've worked with several of the other presenters um, over the past few years. I will share my screen. Um, can everybody see my presentation? Yep. OK, perfect. All right, uh, so my presentation is going to focus a little bit more on the modern day. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history, um, some parts of what we had already discussed here today, but um, in a little bit of a different context. Um, so today's Wilson is really more about how EF Wilson is remembered and commemorated and spoken about within the community of Sault Ste. Marie. Um, as kind of a figure that is a little bit more different than his actual self. Um, so today on the grounds of the former Shingrock Residential School Center, what is now Algoma University, there are different monuments and buildings that represent different eras of the Shingrock School, which was first built on the site in 1874. Um, the image that you see on your screen is one of the best images I think I found of the original school layout. Um, in the foreground, there is a hospital building. Um, next to that is the main building before the addition was added on. And then over more is the, the Bishop Farquhar Memorial Chapel, which is still on the property. Um, it is the only building that has actually left um, from that era on the site. and. Uh, as the name suggests, what is carved in over the door, it is dedicated to the first bishop in the Diocese of Algoma. Um, so that in itself is also a commemorative object on the site. Um, the cairn, which is directly on the front lawn in front of the modern Shingwak Hall building of what is now Algoma University, um, was erected when this first school building was torn down in uh, 1935. And it was built and placed there by the principal and superintendent of the Shingwak Residential School um, in commemoration of its start as the Shingwak home um, by E.F. Wilson. And he was really seen as a, a kind of missionary, a pioneer of education, um, somebody who cared about his students. And the stones of that cairn are actually taken from the principal's residence of the Shingwak home. Um, so that's it just placed there. And as you can see, it's it's quite prominent um, when you see the front lawn. Um, and I mean, it creates a, a lot of current emotions within the community as to why it was placed there. And for those who aren't as familiar with residential schools history or with um, EF Wilson on the side of his primary documents or who he was as an actual person, it created um, kind of a, a different myth uh, within Sault Ste. Marie of who E.F. Wilson truly was. Um, so as we had heard before, E.F. Wilson uh, partnered with the Shingwak family, most notably Shingwak's sons. Uh, Chief Shingwak Cones was quite old when he met Reverend E.F. Wilson. He was a signatory of the Robinson Huron Treaty and uh, his sons are pictured here on the screen. Um, the more faded photo, uh, you can't really see Augustine, um, but he's pictured with Augustine and his family. And then he's also pictured with Bakwa Janini. Um, this photo has already been seen, uh, but he carried on this relationship with the Shingwak family, later known as in some lineages as the Pine family. 
um, and really tied himself to them in a way that made him uh, more accessible to the Garden River community. Um, so Chief Bakujanini, like his father and like his brother Augustin, um, they still advocated for their rights under treaty. They still advocated for proper housing and education for their people, and they still advocated for the rights of their communities. Um, we're going to get into uh, how some of the narratives have changed in Sault Ste. Marie. So the first school, as had been mentioned a couple times, um, was built first in Garden River, and it was a structure that was built from wood. Um, and it was built in 1873 and burned down within six days of its opening. Uh, now, in the earlier days of the uncovering, I guess, of of this history by the Shingwak Project and by allied historians or allied academics at Algoma University in the 1980s. Um, the narrative that I had seen when I was archiving materials was that this fire was an accident. It was an overturned candle, it was winter time, um, it, it was a tragedy, uh, and then Wilson, you know, heroically saved some children. Um, he lost a child um, and he, you know, carried on the wishes of having this school built on another site. Um, however, I mean, <laughs> the primary source documents, as we have heard from other presenters, pre show that uh, he wanted this school constructed away from Garden River because he was afraid of another fire. And that was because uh, the community began to share in the 1980s and 1990s that this fire was intentionally set um, by parents, by other community members, by people who felt you know, that this was a threat um, to their identity and their way of life. Uh, and E.F. Wilson, I think, knew that as well. And that is why he had the school placed uh, for the second iteration so far away from Garden River. Um, so these are some photos of E.F. Wilson with his family. Um, as you can see, you know, this is how he treated his family and he was pictured with them often um, on the site. Uh, the top one here was actually at Shingwalk. Um, and then we see how he takes that aesthetic and really imposes it on his students. Um, so to get to know a little bit about um, Wilson's philosophy, um, Wilson was presented as a close friend of the Shingwak family and the people of Garden River. He gained an land allotment from the tr Anglican church as interest to build a stone um, building away from the community. Um, it is now known from primary source research, primarily Wilson's publications, like the one in the middle here, Our Forest Children, um, that he did this in order to transform the people of Garden River rather than work to educate the people of Garden River. Um, he was quoted actually in Our Forest Children and his publication, The American Indian, um, as saying, one day the Indian will look on, the, on his history as the Englishman looks upon the philosophers of the ancient Greeks and the empires of Rome. Um, so he felt that uh, the traditional cultures of the Anishinaabe were um, something in a cycle that was to disappear and that they had to adopt modern and civilized ways in order to continue um, their development as a civilization. Um, so back to the cairn. Um, the cairn on the front lawn is kept there by the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association. It was told to me by survivors that this was kept to tell the truth and remember the celebration of Wilson and the harm that this commemoration had caused. Um, the Ontario Heritage Trust um, actually erected another plaque on the site in front of the, the Bishop Farquhar Memorial Chapel um, dedicated to Shingwak Hall. As you can see from the text, um, it's, it glazes over um, the harm faced by students at the residential school. And it actually doesn't talk about the original um, Xing Wakons or his vision. Um, it does talk about the school that was destroyed on Garden River, um, doesn't say why. And it also highlights the fact that students were given religious instruction 
and instruction in occupational training and homemaking skills. Um, so it was really, uh, it was really marketed as something good that E.F. Wilson had done. Um, this plaque, uh, just as a note, has been petitioned to be rewritten by the Shingwa Residential School Center since 2019, and they've not received a response yet. Um, so the CSAA, the Children of Shingwa Alumni Association, and their family members celebrate Great Chief Shingwak's legacy, a man who traveled from Garden River to Toronto as an elderly chief to campaign for the better treatment of his people as guaranteed by their treaty. Um, Shingwak's vision was a teaching wigwam, which was a rounded structure um, used by the Anishinaabe for various purposes. Um, this vision uh, has been dubbed a vision of cross-cultural education, and Chief Shingwak initially wanted a school, yes, um, but a school where Indigenous children could be educated in what they needed to know in the changing world and still retaining their identity, language, and culture of the Anishinaabe people. Um, this vision is being realized by Shingwak and Amagamig uh, presently on the site, but has yet to be fully implemented by Algoma University. Um, the past 20 years have brought significant change to the commemoration of this site. Uh, CSAA particularly has been more involved in the narrative of more recent commemorations, um, especially since the blue plaque, which was probably erected um, before the school formally closed or shortly after. Um, the survivors on your screen right now are Shirley Roach and Shirley Horn and Mike Kakaji, um, who are all still very involved with the running of the Shingwak Residential School Center, the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association, and its present commemorative efforts. Um, so a couple of the monuments currently uh, in accompaniment to the ones of, that uh, celebrate Wilson, um, the larger one there that has a metal plaque surrounded by smaller stone plaques. Um, that one is erected opposite of the stone cairn on the lawn. It remembers the students and is surrounded by the seven grandfather teachings. It specifically honors the students who did not return home from residential schools and highlights the fact that they still carry their seven grandfather teachings, their language, and that the building did not take it away from them. It faces the building um, to kind of say this to the building in defiance. Um, the other cairn that you see has actually been erected in the Shingwak Cemetery and is in memory of everybody buried in that cemetery, regardless if they have a marker or not. Um, the Shingwak Residential School Center um, has been telling new stories on their tours since about 2011. Um, a lot of it more focused on um, the, the actual evidence and the scholarship and what is held in the archives and collections. Um, the staff of the Shingwak Residential School Center is also really taking um, the initiative on themselves to reach out to the wider Sault Ste. Marie community, having discussion circles um, and difficult conversations with settler community members and educating them on the harms, the continued legacy and the impacts of residential schools. Um, as somebody who has given these tours for over three years, I can say that consistently I'm presented with people who ask me, well, you know, Chief Shingwak had this vision for the school and he partnered with Wilson. This is what I heard from my family. Um, so wasn't Shingwak's vision um, this residential school? Then didn't, didn't Shingwak want this? And, and the honest answer is no. Um, Chief Shingwak did not want what was created in his namesake. Um, what was created was really Wilson's vision rather than Chief Shingwak's. And he used Chief Shingwak's name, I think, to um, gain support with the local communities in order for them to send their children to him. And then later on, gain the support of the government and the church to forcibly take those children to his school. Um, the current uh, galleries of the Shingwak all exhibits um, highlight more the Anishinaabe story and the Anishinaabe point of view, the point of view of the survivors and the point of view of their families. Um, previous uh, commemoration on the site did heavily rely on the narrative of Wilson and um, his 
I guess, good intentions narrative of trying to do the best that he could within a bad system. However, it neglected to mention that he in fact created that system. Um, the legacy is not helpful of good intentions, nor is it helpful to bring up good intentions when survivors or indigenous communities share the harms of residential schools. Um, within Stu St. Marie, it does nothing to help healing and it removes accountability from settler society within the history of this site. Um, future galleries and phases are planned for Shingwak Hall and the expansion of the Shingwak Residential School Center is planned as well. Um, Commemoration and uh, the effects it has on settler society, especially those outside of heritage, can be damaging to the efforts in restitution and healing. Commemoration guided by survivors, indigenous communities, and their families are key to a better understanding of this system. It is also key to have commemoration specifically at the Shingwak site guided by survivors as this was their childhood home and the land actually should belong to them. More work needs to be done in Sault Ste. Marie and further across North America to understand that the good intentions narrative and heritage commemoration only serves to soothe one community's conscience while ignoring the harms faced by the other. While the narrative is changing in Sault Ste. Marie, thanks to the work of the children of Shingwak and the Shingwak Residential School Center, there are many who still believe in the allyship and cross-cultural intentions of E.F. Wilson. It shows the power that these historic plaques and the sense of official narrative that they give. And uh, I have no suggestions on um, the further work that could be done. Um, I always default that discussion to the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association. And I have faith in, in their guidance going forward um, with the commemoration on the site. And uh, that's, that's my chat. <laughs> Thanks, Skyly, and thank you, um, all five uh, presenters. Um, we are going to um, stop recording, and then um, we have some time for questions. Um, we wanted to offer um, the opportunity to any survivors or, or family members or any folks um, you know, who have a personal connection to this history. Um, we wanted to let them um, speak or 